So the schools I looked at then when I was transferring were Iowa. They had Chuck Long, who was going to be mm-hmm. a senior. Miami and Vinny Testaverde. Uh, Arizona State. Oh, uh, come on, man. Yeah. Thank come you, on, man. Thank goodness you yeah, didn't choose saying. them. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't have Troy Aikman if he got Arizona, <laughs> Arizona State. I will say there's probably only one way to start this, though. And tell us about how many times you exposed this guy in practice back in the day. Shit. You know what? <laughs> I mean, we're pressing record. Let's hear it. Daily. That, that's what I'm thinking. See what I'm that's saying? That's what I'm thinking. Try- Left this dude's head spinning. <laughs> he, he did. He did, actually. But, hey, listen, let's start this, man. I want to go back. Troy, I want to go back to West Covina because we we – a lot of people don't know. I knew this in the locker room from just being around you that you were a really good athlete growing up. Give us a story. Give us go back to West Covina, California, where you where you were born and raised. What got you into sports? Well, Woody, I'll tell you. Uh, I, I was born in West Covina and then moved around. Uh, lived in Whittier for a little bit, El Monte, and <clears throat> a few different places, and then ultimately landed pretty early in my life in Cerritos, California, and, and then lived there until the family moved to Oklahoma. So that's kind of where it all began for me is in Cerritos. But, you know, my sisters, I'm the youngest of three, and uh, I've got a sister that's 15 months older than I am and then another sister that's four years older than I am. And they were they were both athletic, and they were both also cheerleaders when I was young. And, and so I'd go to the games, uh, and they were cheering for the team that was four years older than I was. So it was a pretty impressionable age and watching guys that were, were good athletes. And I, I just knew, you know, when I was of age to, to take on then athletics, uh, that that's really what I wanted to do. My mom's uh, side of the family was, was very athletic. My uncle played for the king in his court. Uh, four-man softball team, and, and he had opportunities to play collegiately. And and all that. So it was just a, it was, it was, it was a part of my life. Uh, all my friends played everything that we did each day was, was around, uh, athletics. And, and then once I got a chance to start playing when I was seven years old, um, it just kind of, it, it came naturally for me, regardless of what the sport was. And, I know when I began at seven playing, that was the only year I played flag football. And I was a, a wide receiver uh, my first year. And then when I was eight years old and began tackle football, uh, I was a wide receiver, started out as a wide receiver. And, and uh, the coaches, as we were going through a drill and running routes, catching the ball, and the coach was yelling at the receivers to run the balls back. You know, nobody could get it. The balls are flying all over the place. So they're, you know, they're yelling, hey, run the balls back. Stop <laughs> throwing them, you know. And, and I, you know, not being very coachable, I guess, at the time, I, I, I threw one back after he had said that. And I, and I you know, threw it good. And, he's, and so I got this coach's attention. And, and then they put me at quarterback. And, and uh, that's, how I, that's how I started playing quarterback. And, and did, really. I was a quarterback throughout my entire career until uh, eighth grade when my family moved to Oklahoma I was really just kind of tired of playing quarterback, thought I might want to try something else. And so when I, when I got to Oklahoma, I told the coach that I, I didn't tell him I was a quarterback. I said, yeah, I don't, you know, they put me at fullback and, you know, I enjoyed it, but not. You wait a minute. Wait a minute. You enjoy playing fullback? Who in the hell enjoys playing fullback? I, 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 well, I, 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 I was not Moose Johnston. You know, there wasn't a whole lot of lead blocks going on. I essentially, you know, split back beer. I mean, I might as well have been a tailback, you know, two tailbacks back there. But about towards the end of my eighth grade season, I don't know why, but they moved me to tight end. And then for the first That's time right. in my life, I had to I had to start trying to learn how to block. And, and, uh, and I didn't much enjoy that. And so – Going into ninth grade, I grabbed a hold of the freshman coach and I said, "Listen, I said, you know, I, I actually am a quarterback. I said that's what I've always played." And, and you were probably the fifth year. guy that said that to him that day. Yeah, and I was, and I was the biggest guy. Uh, I was literally the biggest guy on the team, and and uh, we were a running football team. The coach wanted to keep me a tailback, and uh, 
he reluctantly moved me to quarterback, thankfully, and and then I played quarterback throughout high school and and then on to college and elsewhere. So, so hold on, I want to go back to something. Is it fair to say that one of the greatest quarterbacks ever became a quarterback because he hated running? Or he hated blocking. <laughs> he hated no, blocking talking, first. Talking, talking about the original story when he threw the ball back. He's like, I'm not trying to run the ball back. Like, <laughs> yeah, I was. Yeah, exactly. I wasn't overly excited about, you know, running the football either. And um, so it all it all worked out. I was glad that, uh, of course, then I go to Oklahoma and, I'm, you know, you say running. It, it made me think of when I went to Oklahoma and I'm running the wishbone, which yeah. I still have no I, I have no understanding as to how that even came a part of my my life. But it was. And um, yeah, I got to stop you there. I got to stop you there. So you're going through you're in high school. You're playing the quarter. Are you guys throwing the ball in, in high school or are you guys running more like a Vera wishbone? In high school, we were, we, were uh, we threw it a, not not like they do today, but we were more of a veer split back option uh, a running game. But then we also we weren't a we weren't a real like I said, I was the biggest kid on the team, and it, and it, I, you know I, I was tall, but I, I wasn't big by any means, and and uh, so we were undersized, uh, had to throw it a fair amount, and uh, you know my junior year, Woody, uh, we were. <laughs> They changed the conference to four team conferences, so you only played three conference games mm. at the end of the season, right? Mm. We were zero and seven mm. when conference play began, and we lost our first game in conference play. So now we're zero and eight, right? Mm -hmm. And then we won our last two games to go two and eight. And at the time, they were and we finished second place in our conference, <laughs> and they were taking first and second place teams. <laughs> to the state championship, <laughs> to, you know, to the tournament. So we were going – it was the first time in, I don't know, 30 years that a team from Henrietta had made the state playoffs, but yet it was one of the worst records in school That's history. Right. You know? so, <laughs> we were our, – our mantra was 2-8 and eight going to state. 2-8 and, <laughs> going to state. And, 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 I, and I, felt, I felt like we were just kind of starting to peak at the right time. You know, like we were kind of hitting our stride. We were a two-game winning streak going into the state championship. And it, had we have won the state, had we have won the state championship, we would have had a losing record. Wow. But, uh. but, but that didn't happen because we got throttled the first round. Uh, <laughs> you think? <laughs> you think? So we, we finished two and nine. And, uh, we knew how that story was going to end. <laughs> yeah, they don't talk. They don't talk much about that team, but um, they probably should. One of the greatest uh, teams in history. <laughs> <laughs> two and nine. That's Troy, right. talk about that transition though from California to Oklahoma, because culturally it's a big shift. And you know, growing up, and I'm, I'm from California, so I can. Uh, I can at least speak to it a little bit, right? There's a big cultural shift. So you make this move with your family from California to Oklahoma. What was that like as an eighth grader? And you're making this life transition. It's different from moving California to California city, right? But to go from, yeah. from West coast to Midwest, or I mean, is it Midwest? Yeah, is Oklahoma yeah, ticket yeah. to it's Midwest? It's its own area. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what was that like for you? Uh, it was, it was really hard. I mean, uh, because it's one thing if you're moving geographically the way that I did, but the, 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 the whole culture and lifestyle for me was dramatically changed as well. It wasn't like we moved from Southern California to Tulsa, Oklahoma or Oklahoma city. I mean, we moved to a really small town and <clears throat> where I grew up in, in California, uh, from my backyard, you could see the, uh, parachute uh, ride at Knott's Berry Farm. You know, we were, yeah. we were right there. I rode my bike everywhere and, you know, it was easy to get around. And then when we moved to Oklahoma, we moved out to, we moved on to 200 acres and seven miles outside of town, dirt roads. And, and we had, we had a, we had a working, uh, farm. And mm. so I all of a sudden had responsibilities of, of feeding the cows and the pigs and taking care of the chickens and hauling hay in the summers mm. and, <clears throat> you know, quite a bit. Um, and I remember thinking, because I always thought I was going to go on and play professional baseball or at least collegiate baseball. I mean, uh, that was my first love, and I was a good player, and all my buddies were playing collegiately. I had, I had several uh, guys I played with go on and play college baseball, some of whom went on and played in the big leagues. And and that's, that's the route I would have gone, there's no doubt. And then uh, when I got to Oklahoma – 
the competition wasn't the same by any means. There wasn't as much emphasis on baseball. It was all geared around football. And I just kind of thought that uh, my my path had been derailed and, and I was never going to be able to realize the dreams that I'd had for myself. Mm. I, I, I wasn't bitter and I, and I wasn't resentful towards my parents, but but that's what I was thinking at the time. And, and uh, you know, as it turned out, of course, several years passed. I mean, I was there six years through junior high and high school, but uh, it wound up being a real blessing for me going to Oklahoma and, and having the opportunity to experience uh, city life and then also rural uh, life with all of the chores that go with that. Uh, I've got a real appreciation for, for both sides of that. And, and now as a father, I really wish my own daughters had gotten a chance to experience some of the things that I got to learn uh, growing up there in my formative years in Oklahoma, because I, I, I feel that those six years in in Henrietta really shaped me into uh, what I've become or what my beliefs are or the value of hard work and, and, and all those all those principles, you know, and uh, it was just a really great experience for me. But uh it, it was hard. Um, I wrote a, you know, I wrote a children's book back many years ago, and, and the title of it was, uh, was called Things Change. And it was appropriate for me because that's kind of been my life. There's been a lot of changes throughout my life, and I, I really have learned that through that, when I look back on my successes, they've usually followed uh, times that I thought were real setbacks or challenges, um, if you will. And, and that was one of the first uh, in the family moving uh, and then kind of having to, to regroup, so to speak, uh, when I was 12 years old. So you make, you go on through high school and you get drafted by the Mets, actually, right? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting story too. I, I didn't actually get drafted, Woody, but they were, they were talking to me and uh, they they kept asking me because I had already signed my letter of intent to play football at Oklahoma mm-hmm. before the major league draft, baseball draft. And so the Mets kept asking me, Hey, what's it going to take for you to not go to college? They didn't want to waste a draft pick on me and then me just go on and play at OU. So <clears throat> I kept holding them off as best I could. I, I, I it had always been ingrained in me to, that I was going to go to college. So I always felt that I was going to go play football in, in college. I had hoped at one time to actually play baseball as well. But uh, so the Mets, I, but I, what I wanted was that, you know, when I'm 53 years old doing a podcast with you, I could say, yeah, I was drafted by the, <laughs> by the Mets, right? I mean, well, that's right. That, that, was, that was important to me. So they called me the night before the draft and they said, look, we have to know what it's going to take. And uh, yeah, I didn't. I didn't even know what money was at the time. And I said, well, um, I said, I'll tell you, I, and, my, and my parent, my dad really treated me as a grown man from the time I was like six years old. So mm. I, had, I had no parental help on this decision. You know? he, he, just said, <laughs> he just said, hey, you, it out, you know, you say, hey, it's your life. You do what you want. And so I'm taking this phone call all by myself. Wow, you know? that's amazing. No advice, no agent, nothing. And, and uh, I said, well, you know, I think it'll take uh, – Two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and uh, the guy on the other line for the Mets says two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And Daryl Strawberry was the big stud at the time for the Mets, and he says Daryl Strawberry doesn't even make two hundred thousand dollars. And I said, well, that's what it's going to take. If you want me. And, uh, and he's and he and it, it was a short conversation. He just said, you have a nice career at Oklahoma. And he, and he hung up. And he drafted, they drafted, uh, cannot think of his name now offhand, they drafted a kid who, it was my age, but that had signed to play quarterback at Georgia. Mm. And, uh, but he, he did not go to Georgia, and he got drafted by the Mets, and he went on to sign with the Jets, played in the big leagues for a little while. So, right. yeah, so anyway, uh, I, no, I would, <laughs> sadly, I was not drafted by the Mets. Point of the story, though, is shoot your shot. I mean, why not? I mean, what if they said <laughs> yes? Why yeah. not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank goodness they, they said no. I mean, I had troubles in American Legion hitting the breaking ball, so I don't know that my baseball career would have been real good. <laughs> so b- back up a little bit. What was that recruiting process for you? And, and as a 17, 18-year-old kid and going through that and fr- probably for the first time 
and your life, your value as a young man was based off of your performance. How was that mindset for you as I'm approaching and these schools are talking to me and, you know, the local school and, and OU is, is calling you and showing interest. You know, how did you deal with that and balance? Because you just mentioned you did it on your own and that was something yeah. as a young man you had to do. Yeah, I was, uh, I was young. I was young coming out of high school. I was 17 years old and, and, uh, I, uh, I was not heavily recruited. I, I had, uh, you know, at the time, I, I know things have changed over the years, so I'm not sure how exactly it works now. But at the time, I don't know how it was for you. Probably the same as it was for me, Woody. But you, had, you, you, could, you could go on five trips yep. uh, at the time. And, and uh, I had five scheduled, but my first trip was going to be to Arkansas. And Lou Holtz had just left like two weeks before my visit and went to Minnesota and I was really interested in Arkansas. I, I, I liked the program, and I, I, I may have gone there had Lou Holtz have stayed. Right. But Ken Hatfield took over as the as the as the head coach, and he brought this wishbone offense that he was going to run. And and to his credit, unlike Switzer, he he called me up and said, "Hey, you don't fit the wishbone, so we're going to cancel yeah. your uh, your your trip." And and so I only had four recruiting trips. I, I went to Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. Uh, Missouri and Tennessee and and looking back Tennessee would have been the the best fit for me uh, but I, I was young I really was not looking to, to leave state I didn't want to leave that far from home and I'd originally planned on going to Oklahoma State throughout pretty yeah, much my entire high school Jimmy was career. there right Jimmy Johnson yeah, was the head Jimmy, coach yeah Jimmy was a head coach and uh, and he had really started recruiting me about my sophomore year and, and uh, the first night that a head coach can come to your house, Jimmy was at my home in, in Henrietta and uh, selling pretty hard. I was their number one recruit and uh, I planned on going there. Uh, I had a good feel for it. Their offense fit me and and all that. So the second to the last weekend, I went to Stillwater, visited with Jimmy, the whole staff, Woody, that was ultimately in Dallas, Butch Davis, wow. Tony Wise, you know, the list goes on and on, Dave Wanstead, all those yeah. guys mm -hmm. were at Oklahoma State at the time. And and so uh, I remember Jimmy at his house had the recruits over, and one by one he'd have them come up to see him up in his office upstairs. And I went up and, and told him, I said, Coach, I'm, I'm coming to Oklahoma State, but – I want to go to Oklahoma next weekend for my last recruiting trip. I, I just feel like I owe it to myself and I hear it's a great weekend and I want to experience it. And he was trying to talk me out of it, but he said, yeah, okay, it's fine. And so I went and, uh, it was, it was really, uh, an eye opener for me because at Oklahoma, they brought out all the Heisman trophy winners yeah. and, you know, Billy Sims and, you know, they spoke to all of us and, as I was driving back to Oklahoma following my trip to OU, I just thought, you know, I'm, co I'm coming from a small high school. I'm, I really don't know if I'm good enough to play quarterback at this level, but, but I know I can play somewhere. I mean, I knew I could play tight end, linebacker, save. I knew I could do something, you know. And, uh, and I just said, if, if I'm going to play, I want to play where we can win it all, where we have a mm -hmm. chance to win a championship and win a national championship. And they weren't going to do that at Oklahoma State. Uh, and so that's when I made the decision to go to OU and I called Jimmy and told him, I'm going to, I'm going to go to OU. And, you know, he obviously wasn't real happy. About I it, can but. imagine Jimmy's lips were smacking. <laughs> he got them. <laughs> you, know what? you know, what's interesting about that, Woody, is even if I had signed with Oklahoma state, I don't know. I don't remember exactly why it happened this way, but, uh, Miami, Schnellenberger, Howard Schnellenberger yeah. left that job at Miami late in the process. And so Jimmy took that job at Miami right after that signing date. So mm. I wouldn't even have played for him, even if I had gone to, oh, to Oklahoma State. But, but once I got to OU, I was on, I was on campus about a week. And, and I knew that not so much that I'd made a mistake, but I knew right away that, that I could play quarterback at that level. And, uh, and then what I was told by, by Barry Switzer when I was being recruited was that they were going to throw the ball, and that's why we – Keith Jackson was in the same recruiting yeah. class as I was. And, but, you know, it's another story, but they decided when I was then a sophomore and ready to take over that it was easier to, for me to adjust to some of the wishbone concepts because they had so many running backs, and they just felt it fit the personnel better. 
So it was never a great fit for me, and that's not why I went to OU to begin with. So I loved campus. I loved going to school at Oklahoma. But football-wise, it was, uh, for obvious reasons, it, it was a struggle for me. So you end up getting hurt. I think, what, was it your sophomore year or your freshman year that you ended yeah, up getting hurt? So, so I started it. Yeah, so I was redshirting as a freshman. Uh, I was running scout team as a, as a freshman. And then uh, our backup quarterback, who had been a transfer student out of California, he was a, he was a passing quarterback. Mm-hmm. You know, OU was in a weird period where they're tr- they had Marcus Dupree the year yep. before. They're trying mm-hmm. to figure out, are we, a, are we a, an I-formation running team with Marcus, or are we going to you know, be the wishbone? Or So my recruiting class was kind of a hodgepodge of partly passing skill players, and then the other part were guys who thought they were going to run the wishbone, and Danny Bradley was the starter my mm. freshman year. So Mike Clopton, this backup, he gets ruled ineligible. Smart guy, but something to do with the transfer of a class. So he gets ruled ineligible. And then about a week later, Bradley gets hurt. And now we're on our third-string quarterback. Kyle Irvin was a third string. But for whatever reason, they decided as a staff that they were going to start me instead of Kyle. And Kyle was a year older than I was, so he had already been on campus a while. So I went from running scout team to, to playing playing the next week mm. a, against Kansas. We were number two in the country, and I was terrible. We ended up losing the game, and, and uh, it was it was another one of those setbacks for me where where uh, you know I, it was about as low as I'd ever been in my athletic career after after that game. And well, then the next year as a sophomore, I take over as a starter, and I broke my leg uh, the fourth game of the season against Jimmy Johnson and the Miami Hurricane. Mm. Uh, and they were uh, they were really good. There were some great matchups over the years between those two schools. But uh, yeah, so uh, you know Jamel Holloway, he was a true freshman, which at the time I was pretty amazed that a true freshman could because I know what my experience was. It wasn't very good. I was mm-hmm. amazed that a true freshman could come in and play at the level that he did. And now we see it more and more at the collegiate level. But he came in, uh, won the national championship. He was you know Big Eight Player of the Year and. They told me the job was wide open going into spring ball, and um, I, I, you know, I was young, but I wasn't dumb. I said, you know, guy just guy guy just won the national championship. I don't think I, I don't think it's open competition, you know. So I ended up. Uh, that's when I that's when I transferred to UCLA. And Barry was Barry a big. I, I remember Barry being a playing a, a major role in that that transition when you went to UCLA. Is that story correct? Yeah, you know, Woody, I think uh, I think Barry knew he was always really one of my biggest advocates, and mm-hmm. and and I think he knew that I got kind of caught up. I got caught in this transitional period, and and he knew that my my skills didn't fit kind of where he was wanting to go or what they were going to do, and and I think it was a bit of a relief. So when I went in, I went through the first week of spring ball. Uh, and then realized, what, you know, what am I doing? So I walked into Barry's office and I said, Coach, said, uh, hey, I know you said it was open competition, but I just think that, you know, it's time for me to go elsewhere. And, you know, he didn't didn't even try to talk me out of it. I mean, I'd like for him to at least say, hey, you, you know, you sure this is what you want to do? I promise, I promise I'm leaving. If I turn around, I'm out. I'm, I'm turning. <laughs> I really mean it. You're going to let me walk out the door. But uh, he jumped up. He, he, he was great. He, he went through uh, all the statistics, pulls out this file, and, and uh, looked at all the top schools that threw the ball the year before. And, and the criteria for me was that whatever school I went to, they had to have a starter who was going to be a senior because I had to sit out a year. Yeah, yeah. So yep. I didn't want I didn't want to come into a position to where I had to try to beat out an incumbent, you yeah. know. And mm-hmm. and so I just wanted a, a level playing field. And so the schools I looked at then when I was transferring were Iowa. They had Chuck Long who was going to be mm-hmm. a senior. Miami and Vinny Testaverde, uh, Arizona State. Oh, uh, come on, man. Yeah, thank come goodness, on, man. Thank goodness you yeah, didn't choose saying. them. <laughs> We wouldn't have Troy Aikman if he got to Arizona <laughs> State. And, uh, you know, uh, Coach John Cooper was the head yeah. coach at the time, and, and he had recruited me out of high school when he was at Tulsa. So I had a relationship with him. And then and then UCLA, because Matt Stevens was going to be a senior the year that I sat out. And, and, and going back to my days in California, I really knew that California, w- was outside of Oklahoma, was where I was most comfortable. And UCLA was good. 
And if I liked it when I went on my trip, I, I just knew that's where I was going to go. And I went and had an awesome uh, weekend. And the following weekend, I was supposed to go to Miami on my recruiting trip. And so I committed to UCLA. I get a call from Jimmy Johnson on Monday after that trip. And he says, hey, we've got your flights all scheduled and just want to make sure you're good to go. And I said, well, coach, I said, actually, I just committed to UCLA. So I turned. <laughs> turned me on twice. Second time. Yeah. Jim, Jimmy was smacking his lips. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was, so I turned him down twice. And then, uh, you know, then we go full circle, obviously, yeah. when he ends up coaching the Cowboys. All right. So, so you make that decision. How important was UCLA being a good team? Because obviously Miami is the elite of the elite at that time. Yeah. But it really was opportunity. So why – I mean, yeah, you're comfortable in, in California, but, I mean, you have a chance at a national championship in Miami. So what was really that decision maker between the two? Yeah. Uh, so Miami obviously had won a national championship a couple of years earlier with Schnellenberger, and that's yeah. he left right shortly after – right after that, I guess, or maybe a year after. But that, but. But the year before, Miami was – they were okay. Jimmy's, Jimmy's first year or so, they, they, they were okay. Not, not what they became under Jimmy. But okay. UCLA had played in the Rose Bowl the year before. Um, they, they, had a, they had Gaston Green and Eric Ball were their running mm-hmm. backs, a really talented group of guys, great receivers. It, it, was, uh, it was a program that was really on the rise, and I felt that they were really talented. I, I thought that UCLA – uh, I thought it at the time, and I and I thought it throughout my time at UCLA. I thought we were as talented a team as anybody in the country. And you know, my uh, my senior year, we were number one in the country for uh, two or three weeks, and then we got upset by uh, Washington State. But I, I I look back on those years. We had a number of guys who were drafted, uh, had really good professional careers. So yeah, I know Miami. Uh, Miami's Miami, and they're, they're mm. really good, and you're right. Mm. I, I probably wasn't as aware of, uh, of Miami, and, and, and they weren't what they became, but yet I wasn't as aware at the time of, of that football uh, out on the East Coast uh, and who they were playing as much as I was the West Coast schools. So you're you're going through this. So your your senior year, your you played through your senior years. Your senior year ends. Are what what is your mind telling you that? Because you're the you're the number one draft pick. I mean, you do you know at that time when you're in college that I'm going to be or I have there's a possibility that I'm going to be the number one draft pick. Yeah, it it uh, you know it's funny, Woody, how fast things change. Um, because when I I sat out that year and. Uh, at, at UCLA in 86 and then 87 I was competing uh with a guy named Brendan McCracken who had been the backup quarterback and he was more of a runner than I was and and so the offense was going to have to evolve a little bit of, depending on who was going to be the quarterback uh we weren't very similar in our skills and and I ended up winning the job, and I'll never forget it. My quarterback coach and offensive coordinator, a guy named Steve Axman, who was awesome, uh, he told me going into my first start against San Diego State, he said, look, he says, you can't make All-American uh, week one. You know, just play within the offense. And I'm thinking, hell, All-American. I'm not trying to make All-American week 12. <laughs> I was just – you know, I mean, did anybody see my only start uh, <laughs> in Oklahoma? But um, so <clears throat> I, it, it, the year went really well. And then, uh, you know, we uh, we went 10 and 2 my junior year. And I'll never forget that uh, Coach Donahue, at that time, no underclassmen had ever come out early. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Coach Donahue met with me shortly after the season. And, and he talked to me about, returning for my senior year and I it, it kind of threw me off like why we were even having the conversation and I said coach I'm not going anywhere I said I'm, but there was talk at that time that 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 I could be the number one pick had I have come out so <clears throat> for a guy who was just hoping to earn the starting job uh week one to then at the end of the season uh, a lot of NFL scouts saying that if I'd come out I might have been the number one pick at that time uh was was pretty amazing and so um my senior year, uh, we lost a lot of really good players after my junior year, but we, we hung in there. We, we, we won games. Like I said, we were number one for a while. 
And then, uh, yeah, it was, it was, uh, there was a lot of discussion about me being the number one overall pick. It was a great draft uh, class, as you as you know, yep. with Dion and yep. Barry Sanders, mm-hmm. and and then uh, I'm interviewing agents, and the Cowboys were for sale, and and all that happened then with uh, with Jerry buying the team and and bringing on Jimmy Johnson, and but I didn't know that I was going to be their pick until probably about a week before the draft. Uh, Jerry Jerry was threatening even back then. You know, it was interesting is you, you've heard it a, a, a thousand times as I have and, and everyone else now who's been drafted or has tried to sign with the Cowboys. But when Jerry bought the team, had not yet gone through a draft or through a season or anything, and yet he was telling me and Lee Steinberg, my agent, that that uh, I should be willing. Now, the Cowboys were the worst team in football. Right. It wasn't, you know, <laughs> they weren't very good. Right. So he said that I should take half of what I would get anywhere else because I get to play for the Dallas Cowboys. And, uh, <laughs> Selling that. And I, said, <laughs> I said, well, I mean, I, I looked at it the other way. I thought, you know, I don't know. You guys are pretty bad. I think that <laughs> maybe. maybe you ought to pay me twice as much as I could get anywhere else. <laughs> you you kind of answered it right there. When we talked to Darren, he hated the Cowboys growing up and in, in college. What was your, besides that interaction, what was your thoughts on the Cowboys going into that? Yeah, it's a good question. Who was your team, Woody? Steelers growing up. Really? Love the Steelers. And, you know, we didn't have a team in Arizona. So it was either the Steelers and I was sort of like the Raiders. Yeah. But the Steelers by far was, were my team. That's interesting. I, I like the Steelers too. I was kind of a front running kid. You know, I mean, yeah, I liked all the winners, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. from one year to the Been next. There. But Jack, Jack Lambert to this day is one of my favorite, favorite mm. players. But, you know, I, uh, so at the time, I was a big Rams fan. Uh, growing up in California. And even when I moved to Oklahoma, we got a lot of Cowboys games. Um, I liked the Cowboys, but uh, I, I wouldn't say like I was just this huge fan. But when I was coming out, so looking at the, looking at the teams that needed a quarterback and then trying to figure out, okay, where would, I, where would I like to play? Green Bay, before the NFL season ended, Lindy and Fani was the head coach mm-hmm. of Green Bay. And, and he flew to L.A., and met with me and told me that if they had the number one pick, they were going to draft me. And so I didn't have anything against Green Bay. I just didn't – I just knew uh, – I, I really struggled throwing in inclement weather. I mean, if it rained, I, I, I had a really hard time. And I knew that in Green Bay you're going to have days where the weather's a factor. And, and so that alone was, was a reason for pause for me. And then – I was in Arizona, actually, Woody. The last game of the NFL season, the Packers were playing the Cardinals, Mm -hmm. and the Cowboys were playing the Eagles, and both teams were tied going into the final weekend of the season. And had the Packers have lost and the Cowboys have lost, then then the Packers were going to have the number one pick. But the Packers upset the Cardinals. The Cowboys lose. So all of a sudden, out of nowhere, and no no one expected the Packers to win. And so out of nowhere, the Cowboys got the number one pick. So I was really excited about it at the time just because I knew there was a chance yeah. that, I, that, I, that I may not go to Green Bay. Uh, <laughs> and again, you know, and it, was, and it, it wasn't because of Green Bay. I mean, it was just yeah. the weather. So, yeah. it's a good pro- um, you know, that's a damn good problem to have. Yeah. yeah. Well, you yeah. know. Yeah. If I have to be number if one. I have to be number one. This is where I want to go. But, uh, yeah, so they – so. The two the two teams that I that I was interested in playing for were either the Cowboys or the the Chargers also needed a quarterback mm-hmm. at the time and and the Chargers had like the ninth pick in the draft and I had actually agreed to a contract with the Chargers that was that was ultimately for more than I signed with the Cowboys for but to try to get they couldn't move up and to try to get slid down to nine was going to be hard and. But going, uh, but the Cowboys were were definitely a team that I wanted to play for, and and uh, and and going number one overall was important to me. So I was happy that it worked out. And uh, wait a minute, we, yeah, we yeah, need yeah, to go back. Circle we back. Go on back. Yeah. Circle back. We all, we all I was up. I was not drafted right, so I negotiated a couple <laughs> CFL contracts right. But so this is pre walk us yeah walk us through. I didn't know that contracts were negotiated prior to the, the first draft. pick though. Is it always first well, pick? So, yeah. like- so I was, uh, I, yeah. So what happened was the, I was negotiating with the Cowboys mm-hmm. prior to the draft. Cause the, if you're the number one 
if you if you have the number one pick, you can sign the player before the draft, right? right? And uh, and only a few players had had been signed prior to the draft at that time, and and so I was in talks with the Cowboys. Jerry kept saying, "Hey, we're not. We got to take half, and if you don't take it, we're going to draft Tony Mandrich, who ultimately is who the Packers took at number two." And uh, while that was going on, there was discussions with some other teams that had shown an interest. And in, hey, if we're able to to work a deal, you know, what would it take? And would you sign? You know, all those types of things. Got so it. we had worked out a contract with them, but they weren't going to be. So it would be a, if the Cowboys had decided, hey, we're going to draft Mandridge. It was going to be where I was going to have to tell the the other seven teams ahead of San Diego. Don't draft if you me. draft me, if you draft me, I'm not playing. I'm not going <laughs> to sign with you. You know, kind Got of an it. Elway move. Right. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe you can get away with that with one or two teams, but to try to do it with seven teams yeah. is a little yeah. challenging. So, <laughs> it, it it never worked out. And, and the reason San Diego was was again because I was in California and and would would play in a place where I was very familiar. But mm-hmm. um, so yeah, anyway, it worked out. I actually uh, got signed a few days before the draft. Uh, then was in New York. Now they have like 30 players or whatever they have for the draft. But at the time you only were in New York, if you were the first overall pick and you were already signed. Mm. So, uh, I I got to uh, uh, go out on stage and then there was the last draft actually of Paul, uh, 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 P. Roselle. Oh, P. Roselle. Yeah. Yeah. So that, so that was his last draft. And then that first season of mine, Taglibu was the commissioner. And so I, 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 I'm I, I'm thrilled that I got to be out there with Pete Rozelle yeah. uh, before he gave up being commissioner. Yeah. So hey, Troy, you, talk us through, though, that spring from when you graduate college, knowing that you're going to be the first-round pick. How does life look different for you in that time? Well, you know, it's interesting because I was talking to uh, – there's a quarterback that UCLA's after, everyone in the country's after, and I, and, and, uh, and I was talking to him kind of about this process he's going through. And he'll go through it probably again in four years when he plays and then is looking for the NFL. But what I say to these young guys is is just, you know, you look back when you're my age and, and you remember those were those are really great times in your life that you just don't get to experience very often in, in, in anything, you know, as you get older. And to be courted the way that you are coming out of high school and and having people want you to come play for them. And then when I was being drafted and getting a chance to fulfill a dream was, uh, was a really big deal. And, and it was never lost on me. I mean, I, I was never, I never looked back on that period and thought, wow, I wish I would have enjoyed that more than I did. Mm. I, I, I was very aware at the time of what a special moment this was. Uh, I had no idea it was going to be as hard as it was when I, when I got to Dallas, I, I, you know, like I said, we, it was a total adjustment for everybody, uh, ownership, uh, the coaching staff players. Uh, and it was, uh, it was about the hardest thing I've been through athletically my, my rookie year, but, uh, the process of going through, I guess the draft, uh, going to New York, coming back and being a part of the Cowboys with a veteran, you know, some veteran guys, you know, I played with, uh, Ed two tall yeah. Jones and, mm-hmm. you know, some of those type guys, which was, which was awesome. But, uh, yeah, it was a, it was a great experience for me and, and one that I'm still, uh, very fond of when I look back on it. So Jimmy Drash. <clears throat> yeah. You guys come third, back full third, circle. Yeah. Third time's a charm. <laughs> third so you're not getting away this time. <laughs> Give us that first conversation. He drafts you. Now you finally there as a cowboy and Jimmy Johnson's your coach. You know, I was worried, <clears throat> Woody, I was worried that after turning him down twice <laughs> that he wasn't going to take me the third time, you know, the one yeah. now I'm relying on him. Now it's his decision. Right. It's not my decision. I was worried he was going to say, ah, to hell with you, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, which he kind of did anyway. A few months later, he drafted Steve Walsh, you know, and so, wow. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, that was, uh, so that, that got us off to a tough start, but, uh, I always liked Jimmy. Always had a good relationship with him uh, prior to going to Dallas. And then when when I when I got to Dallas, I remember what, before I was drafted when negotiations began. Uh, you know, Jimmy would give me a hard time about not having gone to Miami because of their successes that they had had. They'd won another national championship with him, and and all of that. But uh, it was all really good until. 
uh, until they ended up drafting Walsh, which we uh, it was in the supplemental, and we gave up a first round pick, mm. you know, for him. So you know now you've got two first round court. Two first round picks. One in Steve already had a relationship with Jimmy. I, I had a somewhat of a relationship, mm-hmm. but not like not like Steve had. And he was familiar with the whole staff and knew the offense and you know all those things. So it, and Jimmy has admitted that he really then didn't know how to handle it. So he didn't get in the middle of it. So I never really had a chance to get to know Jimmy very well once I got to Dallas. Mm-hmm. He kind of was hands off because of because of the Steve factor and which I think affected us a little bit. Uh, and then we just, uh, you know, not being very good. It, it really was. I mean, what happened is Jimmy came in, he was always very positive and, and he was like that, you know, for the most part, yeah. uh, even when you got there, Woody and, you know, his, his approach was always to, to accentuate the positives. Mm-hmm. Um, not that he couldn't be tough as you know, but yeah. But he really liked coaching from a positive perspective. And so that's the way things started in the mini camps and stuff uh, our first year together. And then uh, we came back for a camp right before training camp started. And I think he was determined to just let everybody know how things were going to be. And he took off the kid gloves and he and he was he was tough. I mean, he was brutal and. And uh, he got everybody's attention. And I remember we were three and one in the preseason my rookie year. We lost to Denver. And Denver uh, beat us in overtime in the third preseason game. And Elway played the entire game and even overtime. And I mean, mm. uh, so so we're thinking, I mean, hell, we took the Broncos and Elway to overtime, and you know, we're we're three and one preseason, <laughs> buddy, <laughs> above five hundred. <laughs> I'm thinking this this NFL stuff. I mean, <laughs> so we uh, we open up in New Orleans, uh, my rookie year, and we got beat twenty eight to nothing, and mm. it was not pretty, and. Then week two, we traveled to Atlanta, and we did a walkthrough on the Saturday before the game. And after our walkthrough, Jimmy calls the whole team up, and and uh, he's he's smacking his lips, he's all upset, <laughs> and, and he says, "Hey, he says let me let me tell you guys something." He says that that losing shit from last week, that shit is over. All right, he says that is over. And uh, I mean, little did he know it was far. <laughs> Watch. Watch us. We were 0 and 8 before we even won our first game. You know? and then we only won one all oh. year long. So. He wanted to say, "Hey, you better, you better buckle up." We're yeah, yeah. man, I, I couldn't <laughs> imagine. I couldn't have. You know, I came in in '92 when we were we were off to a good start. We were a damn good football team. I mean, yeah, of unbelievable. I could in a loss in that season under Jimmy Johnson was like death. Mm. Like you yeah. lose a game. Oh my God. I didn't want to show up for, for film the next day. Cause you knew it was going to be brutal. I couldn't imagine going, losing week 15 week games yeah. week in and week out without with Jimmy. It was, it was, uh, it was everything you could imagine, Woody. It was, it was brutal. And we, we brought in, and, but I think deep down, I don't think unlike 92, when Jimmy knew we had a good team, yeah. he knew we were not very good. So, he was he was playing tough and hardball and all that with everybody, but I think deep down he just knew, hey, we got to kind of massage this roster. And but he was, we were bringing in all kinds of players each week, and uh, it, it just was not a, not a good situation. And and I think that what happened to me anyway is you come in as a rookie, and the team was the was was the worst team in football uh, before I arrived. Right, mm-hmm. they were three and thirteen and eighty eight. I come in in eighty nine. And we're still the worst team at the end of that season, but you're not really, at least I was, and I'm not thinking I'm responsible for this. Mm. You know, I, I felt like I'm still young, I'm still learning, and heck, this team was bad before I even got here, you know. But year two, that's when, that's when I said, okay, now, you know, I have ownership in this, mm-hmm. and it's time to get going and so we started out, we did, I was 0-11 as a starter my rookie year, and then we fortunately we won week one of my second season against San Diego, so I got that out of the way. You know, mm-hmm. I was able to finally win a game. But then we got out. We, we went. We were three and seven at one time, and it was worse than anything that I had experienced as a rookie because of the expectations. And then, then we got going. We won four in a row, and and then lost out on the playoffs just there at the very end. And we finished up seven and nine. And then North Turner came in and. Mm-hmm. 
and uh, things changed quite a bit for us offensively. We we, we got we got really good in a hurry, and uh, but Jimmy continued to <clears throat> kind of hold everybody's feet to the fire, like you said. And I and I've always said about Jimmy that <clears throat> you know, as you know, we all all three of you guys know, we all know it that <clears throat> we've all been on teams, and there are always it's a minority group of guys who are just hell bent on winning no matter what, yeah. you know, that they're just wired that way. Mm-hmm. And then others, you know, winning, yeah, everybody wants to win, but if we don't win, eh, you know, what difference does it make? Who cares? We'll get them next week and, and all that. And Jimmy knew that. And so he was, he was going to make life miserable yeah. for the team if you lost. And, and for those guys who just weren't totally on board with, with what it took to win. And so, there was nobody, as you know, Woody, there was nobody who had more fun after a win. Yep. I mean, we could win 10 to 7, and he may be unhappy about some of the play, yep. but on Monday, it was a big celebration. Yes, and, absolutely. Uh, and if we lost, it was it was not fun. I mean, you hated going in and, and having to watch the film and, and deal with them. But right. uh, he was great in a lot of ways, and I didn't really appreciate – early on, we, we, we had some tough times, you know, really tough. Jimmy and I did, and – and now he's uh, now he's one of my closest friends. Yeah. So I, I need to go back because I, I knew you when when I came in and got to know you, you know, on more on the personal side as time went on. But what I, I want to understand your mindset because your mindset was you were like one of the first ones when I got into the league to think, okay, he's a starting quarterback, he's a franchise, he's our franchise quarterback. But you treated it as a job. I mean, you went to work every day, and I and I. And not not only was it you, but it was the Daryl Johnsons of the world. And, yeah. and I've told this story on mm-hmm. on uh, on the show before. Is that when I first got to to Dallas, you, you hear about the names like you know you, and then you hear Michael Irvin, how flamboyant Michael is, and Emmett, and you hear all these flamboyant names. But then you walk you walk in, and through many camps, you sort of see you know the the culture of the, of the team. But then you get in the training camp, and you finally figure out, okay, here's the pecking order, and I figured that out when I got to training camp that, yeah, you know, I like there's a lot of guys that are flamboyant, but you were the guy who showed up every single day and put work in and took it serious. Where did that mindset come in from? Yeah, well, I appreciate you saying that, Woody. I, I uh, you know, I don't know. I think probably from my father. My, I, mean, I was raised pretty tough from, uh, from my dad. And like I said, he, he, uh, you know, he treated me as a grown man from the time I was awfully young and, and uh, with responsibility and chores and decision making and, and, and things of that nature. And, and I think that's probably where it came from as much as anything else. And, and uh, I, I don't know, I was just kind of determined to uh, for not so, you know, I wanted to be great, but I wanted to I wanted to be a part of something great. Mm-hmm. And uh, and and I knew I kind of knew early on. I remember when Norv took over uh, my third year. So my first two years weren't all that, all that great. Uh, nine touchdowns, 18 interceptions in both my first two seasons. We were the worst offense in football my second year. And there was 28 teams at that time in the NFL. We were 28th and Norv came in and I remember talking to him in training camp. And, and I really, you know, you talk about urgency in year two, I really felt it in year three. And, and I told Norv, I said, man, and it was his first year as offensive coordinator. And I yeah. said, man, we got to, you know, we don't have time to wait. We got to go. And, uh, and, I, and I think it made him probably a little nervous because he's thinking, hell, this is, <laughs> this is my first year. You know? <laughs> but uh, he says, well, we just got to ease into this. I said, we can't ease into anything, Norv. I said, it's time. You know, I mean, the clock's running. And, and so we, we did. We, we, we were well coached. We got off to a good start and really had a, really had a good season. And, and uh but it carried over, uh, Woody, and I'll be honest with you, the, the years with Jimmy, uh, I was able to I, – I felt like I was able to play the position more than anything else. I mean, I really felt that I got to just play. And, and, and yes, I was demanding, uh, but – Oh, you think? I, I, oh, what, you think you were yeah. demanding? <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I thought that – I really felt that – I felt that I got to be a teammate as well. You know yeah. I mean? I felt like I could focus on being a teammate, doing my job. Yeah. Being the leader of the offense and, 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 and the team. But I, I didn't think that I really had to go beyond, 
much. And, and, and the reason for that is, is that Jimmy was so on top of everything, you know, and, and, uh, so a lot of times Jimmy would call the group up. He'd be upset about the way practice was going. He'd let everybody have it. And then I would be the good cop. You know, I'd go in the huddle with the guys and say, hey, look, you know, don't worry about him. Let's just go in, you know, let's go play and, and uh, have a good practice. And, and it really made – Jimmy really made my job easy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then w- when he left, as you know, yeah. I mean, a lot changed and a lot mm-hmm. of the attention to detail changed. And, and then that's when things even got ramped up even, even more yep. for me. And, and that's when a lot of the enjoyment that I had – uh, began to be taken away a little bit. And, uh, and, I, and I will say, um, I, was just, I was just telling somebody this the other day that, that you know, I got into a, a, a space in the, after Jimmy left that was really, really uh, challenging for me in so many ways. And, and, and I think that, I don't know that I handled it great. Uh, maybe I was too tough. Maybe, you know, I don't know. But I, I do know that if I went back, and did it all over again with, 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 with the hindsight that I have, I, I think that I would have been, I think I would have handled things differently. I think in a lot of ways, uh, this is me talking myself. I think that I would have probably even been a, a better teammate, you know, in a lot of ways. And, um, and I remember feeling that way and thinking that way. And then I, then I've heard guys over the years like yourself and Daryl Johnston or Nate Newton and, Emmett and different guys who have who have really paid uh, uh, you know me a real compliment, yeah. saying, "Hey, look, you know he was our leader, and we wouldn't have done it." And so then I think, man, maybe you know maybe my view of 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 how tough I was or demanding I was, uh, you know, maybe maybe it was all a good thing. I, yeah. I don't know, uh, but it's made me feel good for hearing from those guys and 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 just. All I ever wanted was the respect of my teammates um, and to know that, that I was only there for one reason, and I really was. I mean, I wanted great friends, mm-hmm. but I really wanted great seasons more than anything. And uh, I don't know. I, I don't know how you are, Woody, but I look back on, uh, I look back on my career and, and, and those years, and I do think we left a lot out. Yes, there, we you did. Know? And, it is, oh. and it is disappointing. Yes. And, and I talk about this now with Tom Brady and Bill Belichick that, you know, I always ask the question, who, who, who's benefited more from the other? Has Tom benefited more from Bill or has Bill benefited more from Tom? And, and you, could, you could obviously debate that for a long time. And the reason I say it is because I know for my career with Jimmy, I just got to go play quarterback. Yes. And, and that's what Tom has got to do for 20 years. Yes. And, and, and that's that he, all he's had to do is all I, I say that, you know, respectfully, he's had to, he's just go play the best you can play and be a good teammate. And, yep. and he's not had to worry about the other stuff. And, uh, I don't know that even Tom fully, I know he appreciates it, but I don't know if he truly understands it. Uh, whereas, whereas I do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so. It allowed you to play. It allowed yeah. you to play. And listen, I, and I, and I, I want to just piggyback on that because I, I was a guy on the defensive side of the ball watching uh, when Jimmy left. And, and I think one of the things, and I, I can understand the, the – I was so young when Jimmy left. I only had two years under him. And all I knew was winning championships. But I wasn't present. You were present. Michael Irvin was present. There was, there was a part of you guys that understood the history that could be made if we could have just kept this thing together yeah. and it was, and I wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't have that longevity with Jimmy. So I didn't really understand, but yeah. it took years later to find out when Jimmy left, things weren't the same. There was added pressure on you and people were, we weren't looking at Swiss. We were looking to you to yeah. provide the leadership because we knew there wasn't the, the, the discipline was not there. So you did yeah, a hell of a job, yeah. man. Did a hell of a well, job, bro. Pre- it means it does. It it really means a lot. I mean, I, I you know the respect that I have for you, and so it it you know it's uh, when 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 Jimmy Jimmy had a great eye for talent, and I thought he was great during the week leading up to yeah. a game. I, I never thought Jimmy was a great game manager. You know, he had he he had a, a lot of courage. Would 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 go against the grain and and be a riverboat gambler, which which served us well a lot of times. But 
his ability to draft and and I thought his ability to message during the week was mm-hmm. was something and 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 the thing for us Woody was that what everyone always talks about these guys now if there if there's a quarterback running back receiver that are talented they say oh well that's the new triplets you know I mean that's the new triplets yeah. or whatever it is and 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 so be it but 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 I always say when when you look at the three of us me Emmett and Michael and talk about the triplets they miss the picture if all they're saying is that we were able to play at a high level because you know Michael came in in 88 worst team in football three and 13 mm-hmm. I come in in 89 worst team in football one and 15 Emmett comes in in 90 we're seven and nine we still have a losing record and don't make the postseason and so n- n- none of us three had enjoyed any success without the other mm-hmm. and so the, I I never felt it I don't think Michael did and I and I don't think Emma did either but I, I never felt any animosity about it. okay who's getting the credit here who we just wanted to win, right. and and Michael was the same way, and Emmett, you were that way. Mm-hmm. Daryl Johnston, Novacek, you know, two and a all. All I just felt like we had a, uh, you know, Charles Hay. We had guys who just truly wanted to win, yeah. and our hardest, our hardest workers were our best players, and yeah. and uh, mm-hmm. and it doesn't always happen that way. So I I think that we were able to set a tone for young players that that they just got on board you know and maybe you were one of those guys when you came in but we hadn't won a championship either until right. you got there as well and so uh, I do think that after Jimmy left that began to slide a little bit yeah. and and the attention to detail and the uh, the way in which we worked uh, you know wasn't the same and it, and ultimately it showed you know I mean we, we, we weren't quite as good mm. Troy uh, so I want to learn a little bit more. We talk about mindset on the show a lot. And, you know, you you made a lot of moves through your career, had a lot of setbacks, right? You went to went to OU, you got hurt. Um, you, you, you had to watch a national championship being won. Then you transferred to UCLA. You have success there, but you don't have that championship level of success. What is the resilience? Where do you think that resilience that you have that, okay, I go through, you know, two really tough years and then start to see success, but then you get there and then your expectation is I'm going to maintain success and whatever it takes to get there. How did you, and that was the first time you really truly tasted it. I mean, am I correct in saying that? Yeah, that's a good point. How did, how did you now say, okay, this is the expectation. Although you've, you had not experienced that prior to this, up to your, in this, uh, up to this point in your life. Yeah, not at not at a high level. Uh, you know, we had all my teams that I was a part of when I was in California. We 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 won. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it was a <laughs> it was those years in Henrietta where we were just <laughs> two and nine state playoffs. So <laughs> <laughs> two and eight going to state. Um, yeah, I I think that uh, at the time, whenever teams had gone on and won a Super Bowl. Then they always talked about the Super Bowl hangover the mm-hmm. following season and how they struggled. And they typically had. Most teams had struggled after they'd won a Super Bowl. Guys are doing book deals or appearances, and you kind of lose uh, lose the focus, I guess. And it, it, it was always strange to me because after we won our championship, I thought, man, that's such a that's such a magical time, and the feelings you have when you go through that playoff run and win a Super Bowl. To me, it only fueled the drive that much mm-hmm. more. Like, like, how do you not want to feel this every year? Yeah, yeah. You know, mm-hmm. so I I got even more motivated uh, to 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 win an, at, at all costs, and and so that's really where it came from. And then knowing that we had become an offense that. You know, we threw the ball. The, <clears throat> there's this uh, uh, there's this idea that that all we did was run the ball. Mm-hmm. You know, and and we ran the ball obviously, and we ran the ball well. But we threw the ball really well too. Yeah. And and early on in games, in the first halves, we we would throw the ball more than we'd we'd run it, and then we'd mm-hmm. close out games running the ball. But mm-hmm. if you go back and look at a number of those years, our best years, our our yards per per pass. We were we were number one a few times. We were top three, so we didn't throw it as much as Miami or San Francisco or Green Bay. But when we did throw it, we threw it as well, if not better than anybody who did. Mm-hmm. So we we were a really good throwing team. But with that being said, I, I knew that I knew that I wasn't going to win passing titles or touchdowns. And you know, I would have loved to have thrown the ball more than we did. But 
my legacy was going to be about winning championships yeah, yeah. and uh and that that's really that's that's why i'm in the hall of fame i mean i know that mm-hmm. and uh and so I knew that early on that that this is this is how I'm going to be defined. And and quite honestly, I was okay with that. I mean, that's that's the way as it should be, as, yeah. especially as a quarterback. And so uh, I think that only fueled me a little bit more. And the frustration for me as I moved through my career is uh, I I just felt that there were a lot of decisions being made that I had no control over. And yet they were reflecting on me because of how we were playing on the field. And, and so I, I knew what it was like when I first got in the league and we weren't very good. And then I know what it was like when we got good, that five, six year window. And then you, through that, you earn some respect, you earn right. respect in your own locker room and you earn respect around the league. And I felt like I was at risk of giving that up because of nothing that I could control. And that's where the frustration became. Uh, each year, it got more and more frustrating, and uh, I, I really felt that I'd go on and play uh, after I left the Cowboys. It didn't obviously work out that way, but uh, you know, my career was cut a little bit short. It was. It wasn't. It really was not due to injury. Uh, it was. It was due to just finally at a breaking point, and uh, and not not wanting to continue to do the things uh, or go along with the things that were being done in Dallas. Yeah. Do you think, I mean, how much of it do you think it was from a coaching perspective versus a personnel? Because you mentioned Jimmy and his ability to put, you know, competitors and champions on a roster and he cleaned that whole roster up from when you got there to yeah. the 92 to 95 team. And, and Darren, we talk about it all the time. I mean, the, the competitiveness between you and Emmett and Mike and Dion and Charles, and, and you go down the list and it, the reason you guys were great is because like you said, the hardest workers on your team yeah. were your best players. And that, and, and, and you've seen a lot of teams recently. That's not always the case. And actually, it's right. probably more rare than it is than it is a normal thing. So do you think that 95 year was the transition? Okay, you had the personnel still that Jimmy put together. But then 96, 97, 98, when you start to th- see things change, was it personnel or was it or what was the weight difference between personnel and coaching? Yeah, I think it was a little bit of I think it was a little bit of both. I yep. think it was uh, mostly personnel. Um, and then just, uh, just, you know, the, the, as you know, the, the, the difference in winning and losing at that level is not much. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, just the attention to detail, I thought kind of got the best of us. And, mm-hmm. you know, I know in 94, the year after Jimmy left, uh, we were good. We were 12 and four and went to the championship game and lost to San Francisco in that game. But, uh, I didn't feel that we were as good in 94 as we had been in, in 93, Absolutely. uh, right. with the same players. Yep. I felt like we kind of started to let some things slide and, and then in 95, we weren't as good as we were in 94. And mm-hmm. even though we won a, won a Super Bowl that, that season. And so it just slowly, we, you know, we started losing players. Uh, when Jimmy was there, we, we, I didn't realize how deep we were until, uh, until we started losing some of our frontline players. I mean, I, I, in 92, I thought we were a good team, didn't know how good we were. 93, I, we then knew we were a really great team with the talent. But we would lose a Pro Bowl player and a backup from someone that Jimmy drafted would step in and be a Pro Bowl player. You know, I mean, it was, and uh, and then then we we weren't we we just didn't we weren't drafting the way that we were with Jimmy. I, I think that was, I think that was one of Jimmy's greatest strengths. Absolutely, and, yeah. uh, that he was able to get picks. You know, Leon Lett was a seventh round pick, uh, yeah. a guy who you know was an All Pro player. So we had we had guys like that uh, mm-hmm. that that played at a high level that were that were not highly drafted. And and uh, and then you look at the drafts; they they really struggled. I think that um, you know I don't know that Jimmy gets enough credit. Quite honestly, I, I know he doesn't get enough credit within the uh, within the front office uh, of the Cowboys for mm-hmm. for his eye for talent, but. Uh, they went through a long period that, you know, Woody was a part of those years. They, yeah. they went through a stretch where they really had a hard time drafting players. Man, but, you just uh, went on the Pat McAfee show and yeah. said the same thing. I just said the exact same thing, man. It's just yeah. it, the reality is that Jimmy, I mean, we can talk about the, the levels of talent that are in the NFL because mm-hmm. it's so close. But he he drafted like an alpha dog. He, he drafted guys that were the gym rats. And, and I tell the stories that, and I remember when I first got there, they used to have to run myself and Kevin Smith out of the locker room 
because we'd stay there <laughs> all day. Mm. We hadn't. I mean, we just loved the game that much. So, you know, the, I don't want to get into the whole. Yeah, I don't want to get yeah, into yeah, the yeah. whole yeah. situation with what happened after Jimmy because it's obvious. Yeah, it is yeah. absolutely obvious that, that we stopped drafting the right way. Mm-hmm. Hey, yeah. Troy, talk us through that decision to retire. And, and you know, we talk a lot about purpose and identity and all that, right? You had been a football player, you know, really college on, right? Baseball, football in high school. But then you are you are football and that is how people know you. When you move on and, and you moved on successfully to broadcasting and, and have absolutely killed it there. But now football is taken away. This game that has been your identity for so long. What was that transition like from, and we call it, you know, professional football life to civilian life. What was that like for you? Uh, it was pretty seamless, quite honestly. I mean, um, I, I say seamless in the from the standpoint that I was able to get into something that kind of occupied my time and challenged me, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so when I ultimately decided to retire, Matt Millen was leaving Fox to take on the general manager's job at, uh, at Detroit. Detroit. And so I was told by Fox, Hey, if you do retire, we've got a job for you in the number two booth, uh, Mm -hmm. stepping in for Matt. And then they ultimately, which I did. And ultimately they paired me with, with Daryl Johnston in a three man booth. And, and one of the reasons why Matt Millen left was because, uh, you know, he had been laboring behind uh, John Madden uh, mm-hmm. as the number two guy, and there was no end in sight to that. And so he got to go on and, and do something different. And, and uh, I got through my first year of broadcasting, and I got a call from John. He's a good friend, and he called me up and said, hey, I just want you to know it hadn't been announced yet, but it will be tomorrow. He's leaving to go to Monday Night Football. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, I didn't have any idea how that might impact me, but they decided then to move me and Joe Buck and Chris Collinsworth into the number one booth. And so I've been, you know, in the number one booth ever since. So uh, it, it was an adjustment for me in, in kind of learning this business, I guess, or what my job was and, and how to do it. Uh, but at least I immediately got into something during the football season, which I enjoyed football, I always have, still do love watching it and uh and and wasn't looking for something to occupy my time and uh, i think that's where a lot of guys really struggle is is they retire and you know what are they now going to do and it's one thing to find something that keeps you busy but then also you you want to be compensated in 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 a way Mm -hmm. that kind of motivates you as well and 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 those are hard things um and I understand it. So when I got into broadcasting, I really thought that I would do it for a couple of years before until I figured out what I wanted to do and and then be done with it. But it's turned out it's just been a it's been a great job um, mm-hmm. that I still get the off seasons. Uh, I get to work from home. I get to be around my kids during the week. Uh, I don't miss much. I uh, did a little bit on the weekends, but it's as great a job as, mm-hmm. as I could possibly have. So. I was then able to, you know, the, it, the broadcasting kind of, it scratched the itch of football. Uh, and then, and, but also motiv- motivated me in a lot of other ways. And I, and I, and I never have kind of sat and wondered, okay, what do I, what, do, what am I doing? What mm-hmm. am I going to do? And, and so I feel really blessed from that perspective. Mm-hmm. So, you know, again, you've had this football mind. You've been around football all your life. Has there been any time recently that you've thought about moving on and being a part of an organization, GM, owner? Have you thought, has your mind taken you there? Yeah. Um, I When I was playing Woody at the end, I always thought that that's something I would do. I really thought that I would, I would get involved in a front office somewhere. Um, but... Then as I, when I did retire and then being a single father, uh, the broadcasting just was the perfect job for me to be able to get my girls to school, pick them up, not miss any of their activities during the, during the week. And, uh, and I knew then that it, it would be very selfish for me to, to, to move into a front office and the, and the time constraints and, that'd be very selfish on my part. Uh, cause I, it's not something it would just really be satisfying, uh, you know, any, my ego, I guess. Mm-hmm. And 
So now I've got a senior and a junior, and and now would be the time where I could start entertaining some of those things, and if it were something I wanted to pursue. But but I'm realistic about it. Uh, in fact, Daryl Johnson and I had this conversation a few years back, and then he ended up, you know, being a GM right. now yeah, for a right. couple teams. But you know, at 53 years old, there'd be a learning process, and there's not many clubs that are are wanting to invest that kind of time into someone my age now, and not knowing how many years are they going to actually get. And I don't know at my stage of life that, uh, that I don't know that I want to go sit and, and watch uh, football practice every day of the week and watch film and all that. Um, mm. You know, I, I think I'd be good at it uh, if I did it. And um, I've had talks with Elway over the years about it and why he got involved and, and what motivated him. And I understand it. Um so I, I wouldn't never close the door, but I just don't think it's something that's going to present itself for me, and mm. uh, and that's okay. But but if it doesn't, uh, which I doubt it will, I think there will always be a part of me that will look back and say, I wish I wish that that had happened, and I and I'd like to know how I would have done. Mm. What's more, what's more stressful, being the quarterback of the Cowboys or being a father of two high school age daughters? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'm I'm really lucky. My, my girls, my girls don't present me a whole lot of stress. Uh, but you know, when they get into high school and and then they're kind of at that age where they feel like they're independent and they're mm-hmm. on their own, and yet there's still house rules and how are we handling all this? And and I do know that where I live here in in Dallas, uh, they 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 play by a different set of rules than the ones I grew up with. Yeah. So, yes. Um, no those, doubt those, that that has been uh, that has been the real challenge. I, I will tell you that I do not adhere to the philosophy that my job is to be the fun parent. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, so, uh, you know, I I feel I have a job to do in, in raising uh, these girls, and I hope they're having a ton of fun. But my job is to be their dad and be their parent. And uh, I don't know that line seems to get blurred yeah. uh, w- when I look around a little bit. That's right. Okay, I try. I got to ask this. Uh, what was, or if you have had it at this point, what is that first meeting of a boy that your daughter brings home? <laughs> what does that look uh, like? <laughs> no, nah, it'll, it'll, it'll be good. It'll be good. You know, I'll tell you what. Uh, Are you a gun owner? Probably for that reason. You know, was, um, but I, I helped out with the high school team this year, and we had a quarterback who was a senior. He was going to go play at TCU. Mm. Uh, Preston Morway was his name. And, and uh, so I, I, I knew all the girls uh, because of having, having daughters, and I got a chance to, to work with these kids, particularly the quarterbacks. But along mm. that, I got to know a lot of these other guys. And just a great, great group of kids. And, and uh, I, I – there's a lot of them that I'd say, hey, if my daughters were dating any one of them, I'd be I'd be pretty happy about it. Yeah. I just, you know, you just hope they they hope they pick uh, the right one and mm. and have a good life. But no, I'm not, uh, I'm not one to try to intimidate them. You know, I want them to be comfortable. I, I just yeah. kind of want them to know what the expectations are. But that yeah. that's been going on. My oldest is has has had a few dates, uh, but uh, hopefully they hopefully they find a good one and and uh, I have a couple good son in laws. I just, I just can't imagine yeah. like being that kid that walks in. Yeah. 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 Uh, Mr. Aikman, uh, it's, it's, good, it's, it's good to meet you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, hey, Troy, we're not going to hold you. We're going to, we got one well, more question. Well, two more questions. You got Sorry, two one, more. One yeah. more. And then, and then our finisher that we like to ask every guest. But so Kirk Herbstreet made, made some news back in March saying how he sees the college football season being different this year. I'm curious. And if hopefully don't get you in trouble by, by predicting or, or, What's your best yeah. guess on what the NFL season looks like this year? Not you're not an expert, but just curious what yeah. your opinion is on, on how it looks. Well, I think uh, even more so here in the last day or two. But I've always thought there was going to be football. Uh, I was always optimistic. I was thinking, man, if you know, there was talk that there may not be, and there may not still be. Who knows? But um, I, I thought that if we're not if we're not playing football like four or five months from now we've got some we've got some real problems, problems. but so I, yeah so i've always been optimistic that, that there's going to be football and i think now with looks like baseball is going to start without fans the nba is going to start practicing again nascar kicked off on sunday and so i i, I do believe now more than ever there there will be football i i do think there'll be fans in the stands i don't know that there'll be sixty thousand people but uh, i think people will be there and 
and uh, and we'll be at those games. There was talk about a month ago that maybe we would be in LA calling the games mm-hmm. um, and not being on site. But I, I I think it's I think it's going to look and feel uh, not not quite like it's always been. But I, I think we're going to be closer to that than than any of the other sports. Uh, I don't know if you caught if you're a soccer fan at all, but they started you know over in Europe they started playing and it is weird. It is really weird having no yeah. fans and it's the atmosphere is yeah. gone. It's still, it's still the sport and it's still good to see it, but it's so weird not having that atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And uh, Fox, I know has looked, Joe Buck talked about it on some podcast he was on recently, but I think Fox has looked at if there are no fans in the stands for the viewing audience at home, uh, how do you pipe in some crowd noise? Mm-hmm. Uh, how yeah. do you make it look like there are fans? in the stands and they've got some technology that, that I don't, I'm not so sure that the viewer at home would know that there aren't right. fans mm, uh, yeah. at the game. And I think that I, I, yeah, I agree with you. I think that would be important to do yeah. as a player. Go would on. it, would it be weird? Yeah, so, so weird. Yes. Well, I'm yeah. just saying, would it be weird to have noise pumped in over the loudspeakers as, as a player? That's it, they yeah, do it. You do it all week. Right. right. So. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if they'll do that. Uh, like ours would just be through the broadcast. Mm. It wouldn't actually mm-hmm. be at the stadium. Oh. Uh, the noise that is, is created. So I, I don't know if they would actually, I, I would be surprised if the league would allow crowd noise at the games. Right. That's been something they've not allowed, uh, up to this point, but uh, for, for, for players, yeah. I mean, we've all played. We all know that, uh, you know, at least, especially for the home team, you kind of feed off that home crowd. Yeah, absolutely. There would not be no home field advantage at that right. point. And uh, it'd be really different. Uh, I, I don't know. I think I think some players, I've heard Kirk Cousins talk about it. Uh, I, I think there are players who would hate the idea of playing without fans. I think there's probably some other players that, that, that might enjoy that. Yeah, interesting. Well, we want to wrap it up. and we appreciate your time we always wrap it up with this yeah. one question with all of our guests uh and the question is not if you could change anything so i just want to caveat that but if you could go back to any point in your life and tell yourself one thing where would you go and what would you tell yourself oh man that's a good question um thank you <laughs> it's really good you know i i don't know i i do know that when i turned uh when I turned 16, prior to being 16, I, I said earlier in the podcast that that I, you know, 17 when I graduated. My birthday was in November, so I was uh, I was pretty young uh, for my grade always, and so I didn't even get my driver's license until after football season, my junior year. And mm-hmm. and uh, my buddies were all driving. Some of them were driving when they were sophomores, and and uh, and I always felt that man, the best thing in life would be able to drive a car to have a driver's license to get in the car go wherever you want to go i mean how can anyone have a bad day if they are old enough to drive you know i mean that was kind of that's 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 how much driving i thought you know meant to me and <laughs> and uh, i really did i mean i felt that there's no way you could ever have another bad day the rest of your life as long as you could drive and so you know you turn 16 and you realize that yeah there are still plenty of bad days and 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 i always remembered that and I always remembered that as a player that even though I wanted to win a Super Bowl as the number one overall pick, I felt that, you know, when you talked earlier about, uh, you know, what was the motivation and where did this drive come from? I, I think for a quarterback, when you're taking in the first round, there's an expectation to bring the franchise a, a world championship. And, and so that obviously was mine. And you think – there's a tendency to think once I do that, then I don't ever have to prove anything again. And, uh, and you, and you realize that that's not true, uh, that you, you prove yourself every single day and you go out and you have to do it. And so I think at a really young age, I, 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 I've, I've been able to kind of keep some perspective on, on life and what's important and maybe some milestones that we all hope to hit. And, uh, knowing that, that, that doesn't in and of itself, uh, make life. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know that I would go back to any particular time. I I do think that as I spoke of earlier, uh, I think that the only real regret that I have has been how I viewed maybe my demands and how tough I was as a teammate and how that would probably look different now. Mm. 
And that's why it means so much to me when I hear from guys like Woody and other teammates who, who, who think contrary to that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I, I have, I really have no true regrets. Uh, wouldn't, wouldn't change, uh, wouldn't change much. And, uh, I'm I'm thrilled, feel feel honored and blessed to have gotten to do the things that I've gotten to do, and uh, and know that along the way there's there's setbacks and and that's life, you mm-hmm. know it happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's what that's that's kind of what I try to pass along to my kids and and young young people when I talk to them. Uh, awesome. Well, man, we appreciate yeah. your time. Eight ball. You got it, bud. I, mean, I got you so got many it, names. Man. Eight ball, cool whip. I mean, I'm, I'm used to calling him all these names, not Troy. So, what do you call you, burnt toast? <laughs> <laughs> you got jokes. Watch your mouth, man. Yeah. I appreciate y'all having me on. Yeah, man. Right, thank, thank you, you so much. Appreciate you. You got it. See you guys. All right, See right. you. Thanks, bro.